most people who profess the craziness and are all in on these long, long, long hustle things, like they keep doing it until they can't. They don't choose all of a sudden, like when they're 35, to go, oh, I don't have to do that anymore. I'm gonna go back to a normal day's work because the habits they've built are all built around busy and, and packed schedules and hustling and the whole thing. So it's very hard to break habits. If that's what you're used to doing, you're gonna keep doing that. And at some point, it's going to collide with reality and life or it's going to keep you from reality and life. And I think that's really unfortunate too. Work is not that important to keep everything else out of your life. That's Jason Fried, co-founder and CEO of Basecamp, a web project management tool that has been in existence for around 20 years. He's also a best-selling author of books like Rework and It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work. You may have even seen his TED Talk on why work doesn't happen at work. Jason has an ongoing commitment to fight against workaholism and the hustle culture that is so prevalent today. In this conversation, you will hear why Jason believes the work week should be capped at 40 hours, what to do if you feel trapped at work, how to practice saying no, and you'll also hear Jason's advice to leaders who want to give their employees autonomy and much more. It's just kind of unusual in the United States. Um, with our, you know, work hustle culture that's that's just, I think, really damaging and really de uh, destroying people over the long term. And I know that, hey, sometimes when you're in your early 20s, you want to put all the hours in and you want to bust your ass and the whole thing. I get it. Like, but the thing is, is that it's not sustainable. And when you have companies that encourage that kind of behavior, when those companies themselves know it's not sustainable, that's almost fraudulent. And, and I just don't want to be that kind of company. Welcome to The Future of Work with Jacob Morgan, where every week I speak with the world's top business leaders, executives, and authors. From leadership to employee experience to the future of work, this is where you will get the insights, the tools, and the inspiration you need to succeed and thrive at work and in life. If you want to future-proof your career and your organization, then this is the show for you. My brand new book, The Future Leader, which is based on interviews with 140 CEOs around the world, explores the top skills and mindsets for future leaders, and it's out now. You can grab a copy at getfutureleaderbook.com. If you want to get in touch with me about sponsoring the show or having me keynote your next event, you can visit thefutureorganization.com or email me directly, jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Lastly, if you get a few seconds, please rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred platform is. It really helps spread the word about the show, and I personally appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Future of Work. Today, my guest is Jason Fried. He's the co-founder and CEO of Basecamp. He spoke at TED. And he's also the author of several best-selling books, and I'm sure you have read several of them, including Rework, and the most recent one, It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work, which I love the title of that. So Jason, welcome. Thanks for having me on. I'm sure a lot of people have have read something of yours, either on Medium or through one of the books that, that you've published, or maybe they even saw your, your TED Talk. Um, but in case they haven't, can you give us a little bit of background information just about you and Basecamp? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, let's see, Basecamp, the company, uh, used to be called 37 Signals way, way back in the day. We've been around for about 20 years. And um, we started out as a web design shop. And since 2004, we've been building software. And Basecamp is the product we're most well known for. It's a web-based um, project management tool. So it's used by all sorts of companies, anyone who has anything they need to get done and keep track of the tasks and the conversations and the decisions and the schedules and the files and all the different stuff that revolves around a project. Basecamp helps you keep it all in one place and keep it organized. So we've been building that for a while. We've done a bunch of other things too, written some books and whatnot. But um, currently, and I should say currently, we're working on a brand new product called Hey, H-E-Y dot com, which is going to be a new email service. So we're tackling email, uh, which is uh, something so that's, that's sort of one of these things, things where it feels like everyone's already done that, that but now they've, they've done, done it wrong. So we're going we're gonna to try to do it right. Bless your heart, Jason. Bless your heart. Every, <laughs> everybody wants to get the email thing figured out. Yeah. And, you know, there was a while where everybody thought, oh, you know, Slack will take care of that. But I'm sure a lot of people who use Slack know that it 
they're actually spending more time now on technology than they did before. So it's uh, may maybe not the best solution. Yeah, I mean, Slack and chat is kind of a major mess for a whole bunch of different reasons. And it doesn't replace email anyway. Even if it was good, it doesn't replace email. Email is yep. just a different method of communication. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but it hasn't really been reconsidered for a while. So we're here to do that. Very cool. And yeah. uh, how many employees do you guys have at Basecamp? We have 56. 56. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and my understanding is that you purposely want to leave it at that size. Yeah, we want to keep things as small as we possibly can. I mean, we this is the largest we've ever been, but we've historically, you know, been much smaller. We started out with three people and, you know, grew to four and to five. And we're very careful about how we grow. So we tend to hire one or two people a year. Um, and keep it as small as we possibly can. I like the idea of a small company where everybody knows each other. Communication's a lot easier. Sharing vision's a lot easier. Getting everyone on the same page is a lot easier. And it's also all we need. I think that's another important part of this too is you end up having too many people and you end up doing too many things that you don't need to do. And when you have fewer people, you can't do more stuff. And that's probably a good thing. Yeah. So that's our approach. What does a typical day look like for you? And maybe you can walk us through uh, from when you wake up in the morning all the way to uh, when you end up going to bed. Well, <laughs> these days, so I've got two young kids at home, five-year-old and a one-year-old. So my my mornings and my nights are dictated by them, basically. So I, I have to go to bed by about nine because I have to get up at about 5.30 or 6 because that's when they're up. Um, so I've got that going on. Um, but, you know, my days are, I would say, atypical in that they're not – um, regular. Every day is a little bit different, quite a bit different, actually, not just a little bit. It just, you know, my days depend on what needs to get done. So some days I'm writing, some days I'm designing, some days I'm thinking, some days I'm doing a combination of all those things, but I try not to do too many things in one day. So I try not to bounce around between five or six or seven separate things. I try to stay focused on one or two or three things max and just do a really good job with those and give those like on my undivided attention while I'm doing them. Um, so for example, let's take today. Today I've been spending um, most of the day writing, um, writing up some ideas for um, what we're going to start working on in a couple weeks um, and also writing up some um, like help documentation slash welcome documentation for new customers who try, hey, the new email thing, which won't be out till April, but we're working on finishing up uh, the onboarding process right now. So I'm kind of focused in on what does it feel like to be a first time user of something? What does it feel like to be a first time customer of something and trying to write things that will be useful for, for those folks. So that's kind of what today's like, but, uh, tomorrow might be something different tomorrow. I might be working on actually sketching out some design ideas for a new feature or a specific workflow we want to improve or whatever it might be. It just, my days are really kind of all over the place. Um, in terms of focus, but when I focus in, I focus in on just a few things in a given day. And then my understanding is that you also, uh, you're pretty strict in terms of, you don't work like 70 hours a week. You're not, you're not yeah. at the office till like 10 o'clock every night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not at all. So we're big believers of eight hour work days, 40 hour weeks. Like that should be enough time. It's more than enough time, in fact, to do great work. So you know, I'm home by 530-ish. Um, I get, you know, it depends on when I get to work. Sometimes I get to work at 9.30, sometimes I get to work at 9. It just kind of depends. But yeah, eight-hour day, plenty of time. Try to get a good eight-hour sleep if I can um, with the kids. Uh, and no work on the weekends and no work at night unless I take some time off during the day. And sometimes I do that because I don't always work straight through the day. Sometimes I'll take a few hours in the middle of the day to do something else. And then I'll pick it up uh, after the kids go to bed or something. I'll put in an hour or two uh, to make up for that time. But I don't work at night in addition to working a full day. I just work a full eight hours throughout the day. That's kind of how, how I do it and how we encourage everybody here to do it. Um, we don't want people working more than 40 hours. You don't need to. And if, and if we're doing that, then we're doing something wrong, actually. Um, I know a lot of companies, long hours is seen as doing something right. Like, you know, let's stay late and let's, you know, work on the weekends and let's pull all-nighters. I think that's completely wrong. And so we're very careful about not encouraging our employees to work that way. It's funny when you say it, it sounds like so matter of fact, like, yeah, you know, just eight, eight, eight hours, 40 hours a week. And then I'm sure most people listening to this are like, what the hell did he just say? <laughs> like, how, how is that possible? And I'm sure you probably have a lot of friends and family members working at different organizations who are putting in 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week, working on weekends, working on nights. And so, I mean, what do you say to those organizations? How how have you been able to just get it to be 40 hours? What if 40 hours isn't enough? 
40 hours is enough um, because that's our limit. And uh, what we do is if we can't get things done in 40 hours, we don't do them or we wait till the next day or the next week or whatever it is. And, and the idea is that what's flexible <clears throat> is scope, meaning our ambition, the work we take on, that's all flexible. If you just keep piling more hours into something, well, you might as well just go to 24 and never sleep. I mean, like it doesn't, it doesn't work. You've got to draw the line somewhere. We draw the line at eight. And then we just say, you know, if we can't get to it today, we'll get to it tomorrow. If we can't get to it tomorrow, maybe we just decide not to do it or we'll do it next week or the month after or six weeks from now or whatever it might be. We don't have to take on everything we want to do and try and get it done immediately. Um, so it's this, it's this sense of pace, of, um, uh, of a sustainable pace, I should say. And, uh, you know, we've been in business for 20 years. We want to be in business for 20 more. You can't work 80-hour days, or I'm sorry, 80-hour weeks uh, if you want to be in business for a long time, sometimes you're going to burn out, you're going to burn people out. It's going to be very difficult. Hey, maybe you can do it, but it's not going to be pleasurable. It's not going to be enjoyable. You're not going to keep a good team together with you for a long period of time. And you're going to lose a lot of great people along the way. And I don't want to lose great people. It's hard enough to find great people. So I want to keep them happy uh, with reasonable work hours, challenging work, great people, great environments and those kinds of things. And so, you know, um, getting everything done is not the idea. That's not the idea for us. It's it's getting what we can get done in eighty hour. Uh, I'm sorry, in eight hour days and forty hour weeks. Uh, you know, over the course of, of many years, that's what we're aiming for. It's interesting because a lot of organizations actually reward employees who work more than eight hours a day. You know, you're seen as more ambitious. You're seen as better talent, as a harder worker. But it sounds yeah. like your perspective is that's actually the wrong message to be sending to your people. I think so. I think so. Um, and I, I know that's not what a lot of companies do, but I really don't care what they do. Because uh, if you're supporting or celebrating, um, quote, work ethic, and work ethic to you means um, just spend as many hours on stuff as you can, like that's not really a good definition of work ethic to me. Work ethic is, do I want to, you know, am, am I, do people want to work with me? Do I work well with others? Do I give good feedback? Do I take good feedback? Am I, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing when I'm supposed to be doing it? If I say I'm going to do something, do I do it? It's those kinds of things. Not how many hours you put in. How many hours you put in is simply how many hours you put in. It has nothing to do at all, zero, with how much you get done or the quality of your work. So I'm not interested in measuring hours beyond a reasonable work day uh, and then equating extra hours to extra work. You can spend extra hours on bad work. You can spend extra hours on unnecessary work. You can spend extra hours doing things that don't matter. You can spend hours on extra hours on busy work. I mean, how is that something to reward? Um, I, I'd like people to, to put a good day's work in and go home and do their own thing, get a great night's sleep and come back rested and refreshed the next day. That's what's celebrated here and what's rewarded here. Um, so yeah, it's a slightly different take, but not really. I mean, it's, it, this is how most European countries work. This is how a lot of wonderful economies work around the world. Um, so this isn't that unusual, actually. It's just a, kind of unusual in the United States um, with our, you know, work hustle culture. That's that's just, I think, really damaging and really de de destroying people um, over the long term. And I know that, hey, sometimes when you're in your early 20s, you want to put all hours in and you want to bust your ass and the whole thing. I get it. Like, but the thing is, is that it's not sustainable. And when you have companies that encourage that kind of behavior, when those companies themselves know it's not sustainable, that's almost fraudulent. And and I just don't want to be that kind of company. And, and it's not even the companies that do that. It's also you see a lot of social media pundits do it. You see just a lot of celebrities and people with big brand names and, and a huge following advocate yeah. for this kind of nonstop hustle culture, work all the time. Like, And do you also agree that that is not the right message to be sending out to people? I mean, it's not my message. I, I don't think it's the right message. Um, yeah. You know, like anything, there's different ways to do things. And certainly we can point to some successful person on the internet who says you, you need to work 100 hours a week to, to get ahead. Like, And like they've gotten ahead, so therefore that's what they're going to say works, right? I mean, it's, it's understandable that that's what they're going to promote because that's their life and that's what they've worked for and that's what they believe in and that's all they've known. So they're going to say that, but... Um, I just don't think like that is, that's an approach to me that that's an approach that do, just doesn't, it doesn't hold up over the long term. You can't work those kind of hours, like over the long term, especially as you, as you know, again, like if you're in early twenties, I could see it's a harder argument to make. Um, 
But at some point you you grow up and maybe you have a family or you meet someone or and you will have other interests in life besides just work and before you know it, like you can't do anything else if you're just used to working that way and if you think that's the only way to work. So perhaps in extremely short bursts or short periods of time, I could see that sort of thing maybe being useful occasionally. Or if there's an emergency or whatever, sure. But as a method of sustained work, I don't believe it's it's uh, viable, frankly, for in the long term. And by the way, the other thing you'll hear sometimes is people say like, well, I'm going to put in crazy hours now so I don't have to do it later. That doesn't typically work out. Most people who profess the craziness and are all in on these long, long, long hustle things, like they keep doing it until they can't. Uh, they don't they don't choose all of a sudden like when they're 35 to go oh, I don't have to do that anymore I'm going to go back to a normal day's work because the habits they built are all built around busy and and packed schedules and hustling and the whole thing so it's very hard to break habits if that's what you're used to doing you're going to keep doing that and at some point it's going to collide with reality and life or it's going to keep you from reality and life and I think that's really unfortunate too work is not that important to keep everything the, everything else out of your life yeah what about people who are stuck in that environment? Because I'm sure there are a lot of people listening to this right now who have those types of jobs and they feel like they're stuck. You know, their their leaders keep piling on more work. I mean, what do you do? How do you how do you get out of that? I mean, let's say, for example, you I mean, worst case scenario, let's say base camp tomorrow vanishes and you're stuck getting a full time job uh, for a. Uh, I don't know, an IBM or a yep. McKinsey, you know, one of those typical firms, what would you do? Well, it's tough. You know, it's tough when you don't have a power or you don't have control over a situation. So it kind of depends on who you are and where you are. I think the first thing to recognize is like, what control do I have over this situation? And if you're in a place where all they do is push you to work 80 hours or you're pushed out the door, then, I mean, there's not a lot you can do. You can complain. Uh, you can also um, just see what happens if you, if you, work less and see if they notice. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can try to do, but ultimately if the culture there is one of rewarding whoever's the last to leave and whoever's the first to get there and whoever's putting in the most hours and whoever's in the most meetings, and that's not the kind of life that you want to live, you're going to have to get another job. There are plenty of companies out there that don't do that, that, that aren't pushing people at to, to extreme length. So there are options. I mean, I'm not suggesting it's easy to get a new job and I know it's certainly hard to quit and, and losing your life. I, very, all these things are incredibly hard to do, but at some point you're going to have to figure out like what kind of company do you want to work for? What I think is probably more useful for most people, <clears throat> since most people don't stick at, at the same job their whole life, right? Most people change, especially these days, is to think about where you want to work next. And when you get around to where you want to work next, thinking about essentially hiring the company, not just getting hired at a company, but being very thoughtful and selective about the kind of places that you apply for a job. Don't just apply for any job, but apply for a job at a company that you want to work for because you like their culture, because you believe what they believe in, because you believe how they treat people and they like, you know, they, they take care of folks and they understand what it's like to have a life outside of work and those sorts of things. So maybe you're stuck somewhere right now. Good news is you probably won't be stuck there forever. Uh, there'll be other opportunities that open up in the future. And when you have those chances to go look for a new job, you know, do some hiring on your own, basically. Look and apply for companies that you want to actually truly work for. You've also written a lot about work, uh, just through your books, through your articles on Medium. So very high level, what is your, your general perspective? What are your thoughts on work today? What comes to mind? What comes to mind about work? I mean, I think... It's a little bit about what we've been talking about, which is um, I think there's a lot of um, people who feel trapped by work. They feel like uh, it's crazy at work all the time. You just ask people what it's like at work. You know, just ask your friends. Like they're like they'll probably say, "Oh, it's crazy. I'm crazy busy. It's crazy." And I just think that's unfortunate. And I, I think that um, you know, I know not only do I think I know it doesn't have to be that way. Um, but people get caught up. And one of the problems is there's actually kind of two problems, especially in my industry. This does not apply to every industry. And I can't speak generally about every industry. But in like this tech software world, um, this this notion of um, chasing endless growth is part of the big problem. Companies go out and raise money and they attach themselves to unreasonable expectations at that very moment when they raise money. And now their whole story from that point on is about growth. It's not about quality. It's not about doing the right thing. It's about 
can you grow enough to provide a certain return to an investor? That I think is a, is a broken path. Um, and it's one of the sources of the craziness and, um, the, the chaos and the long hours and the, you know, growth at all costs and do whatever it takes kind of mentality. I think it's in the hustle mentality. I think it's really dangerous, um, and destructive. And certainly there, look, there's some companies that come out of that world that do great things. Obviously there's always an outlier here and there, but to me, this isn't about like picking out outliers and going, well, what about them? And what about them? It's more about, what about you? What about over the long term? What's sustainable? What's reasonable? What do you think you can live with? And different people have different thresholds there. But so you've got you've got money that causes people to be focused permanently on growth. And then you've got a world full of distractions, which has gotten worse and worse and worse. And like you alluded to it earlier with things like Slack and other chat tools and real time chat and the expectation of immediate response and everything's being sped up in a way that it ca- it breaks up people's days into tinier and tinier and tinier bits of time, which makes it really hard for anyone to s- like to settle in and focus on real work. So they're bouncing between this chat room and that chat room and this real time conversation and that real time conversation, this instant message window, and that meeting and you know, like, and th- there's this expectation that if someone asks you a question, you need to get back to them immediately. And if they don't, then they're going to hit you up with a different medium of communication. Maybe you didn't respond to the chat, so now they're going to email you. Or they're going to email you first. Then if you don't respond to the email, they're going to h- chat you up in 20 minutes. And then they're going to call you or walk over to your desk. It's like it, no one has any time to do work anymore because we're all playing this interruptions game. And so I think those are the two things, this this no, this feeling of, of the, feeling of a necessity of endless n- – unreasonable growth expectations and then being constantly distracted all day long. These are the two things I think of when I think of work these days. And I think it's unfortunate and hope that it changes down the road um, because it's going to have to. I think people are careening into an unsustainable pace and an unsustainable future. Yeah, I always, I always say that connectivity doesn't mean availability. And, uh, yeah. you know, there used to be a time when with email, if somebody sent you an email, you could get back to them in like a day, maybe two days. And today, if you don't respond in like 20 minutes, people freak out. And yeah, it's, you know, email has become basically like a chat uh, platform now. And it's, it's, it's totally, uh, totally insane uh, what's going on with this. So I, I completely, completely agree with um, with some of the things that you're seeing. And, and let me just add something right there. Sure. If you don't mind. I mean, part of the problem with that is it all comes down to human expectations. Like email has not changed. There's nothing that's like if you get back to someone a day later or two days or three days or five days or five minutes, it's still the same thing as it ever was before. It's now that our expectations have changed. We expect immediate response. And it's actually a really selfish thing to expect that just because you wrote something quickly and you sent it off to someone instantly. It doesn't mean that they are available to receive that information immediately, nor does it, is it fair to them that they're going to have the answer immediately or they're going to have the response immediately or that whatever else they're doing is less important than what you need them to do? I mean, this is all about respecting one another and recognizing that very few things actually need to happen immediately. So if I email you and you get back to me a day or two later, that's fine. Of course, unless it's a true emergency. And if, if, if it is an emergency, email is probably not the best medium anyway. But then, you know, call me or whatever. But there shouldn't be emergencies all the time. That's the other problem is that everything's ASAP and everything's on fire all the time. It's like, shouldn't be. That's another problem. So, you know, it really comes down to expectations. And here at Basecamp, we do not have an expectation of immediate response, no matter what medium you use, unless there's an emergency. The expectation is you'll get back to me or I'll get back to you whenever I have time or whenever you have time. And it will be reasonable. We're reasonable adults. So we'll get back to each other within a reasonable amount of time, not five weeks and not even a week, but maybe a day or two or maybe an hour or maybe five minutes if that's when I have available. But the point is that we all need to respect each other's time and attention and not just demand it from each other all the time, no matter what's going on. So here at Basecamp, sometimes we have conversations that last a few days. We don't use email internally for these, but we use Basecamp. But these are long form email style communications with back and forth comments uh, and, you know, we have people across the world who work for us in different time zones and we'll hash something out over a day or two. It's totally fine. It didn't need to happen in 15 minutes, even though in most companies it would feel like that's too long, a day or two. What are you talking about? Like, well, what's the rush? So what's the rush is a question we ask ourselves all the time. And I think it's a really important question to always ask yourself when you expect someone to get back to you immediately. Hmm. Simple question. What's the rush? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, have a, I have a deadline tomorrow, Jason. I got to meet it. <laughs> Right. And that, yeah. Sometimes that's true. Right. But most of the time it's not. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah completely agree. Uh, I'm curious, have you always thought like this? You know, like if you were to go back, I don't know, five years, 10 years, even 15 years, was there an earlier version of Jason who worked the 70, 80 hours a week? And did something happen in, in your life or your career that made you realize that, you know what, this, this doesn't make any sense and I got to change? Yeah, I think there were moments in my life at some point earlier on when I did work more hours than I do now, but I've never been an all nighter kind of person. I've never, never been a wake up in the morning and work till it's dark kind of person. I mean, unless it's like winter and it's dark at four o'clock here in Chicago, but you know what I mean? I, I've never been that person because I try to focus in on what I'm doing and really like really focus in. And you know what? If you put in four or five really focused hours of work, like really good work, you're tired by the end of that time. Anyway, the notion that you can actually put in even eight, but nine or 10 or 12 full focused hours of work in a given day and not see diminishing returns, I think is completely unreasonable and, un, and unrealistic. So the truth is, I think if you're really focused on your work and you're really focused in and you're not being distracted and you give yourself four or five hours of great work a day, you're done. You're mentally done by the end of the day. You're very satisfied. You feel fulfilled and you're done. So that's, you know, to me, it's not so much about like counting the hours, like what I worked when I was 20 or 30 or now I'm 45, that kind of thing. It's more about how have I worked? And I've always tried to be as focused as I possibly can on one or two things in a given day and, and worked with long stretches of uninterrupted time, like hours at a time. And, and then you're, you're done. Like you, you feel like you're done. You're done. You've done your work. It's, you know, the thing is, is that most people don't have time at work anymore. So I've asked people at conferences, I, you know, go on stage and I'll speak to whatever, few hundred people and I'll ask people, hey, um, when's the last time you had four hours to yourself at work? And like essentially no hands go up, maybe a few, right? But I've, I, I did this a few years ago, it was like 600 people in the audience, I think like 20 hands or something went up or 40 or something, right? Like a small, small number of people. If you have four hours though of contiguous time in a day, you're, you're, that's a lot of time. It's a ton of time and by the time you're done with that time, you don't want to work anymore because you put everything you had into it. And so that's how I've always been. And um, I'm certainly, I'm certain there were times when I was younger where I maybe put in more of those hours, perhaps because I had more stamina then, or I had fewer responsibilities or obligations then, but I've never worked silly hours. I've never worked c crazy hours because they're just not necessary. And they're also like, it's very rare that you come up with the breakthrough on some creative problem when you're tired. What happens is, is you stop working, you go to sleep, and you wake up in the morning with a new idea. Or you wake up in the morning, you take a shower, and you have a new idea. That's where the new ideas happen. They happen when you're refreshed, not when you're exhausted. So I think that's kind of the key here. Can you walk us through how you work? Because I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are wondering, how does how does Jason actually work? Like, do you do you batch tasks? Do you do to-do lists? Do you, like, how do you get those four hours? How do you actually work during the day? Sure, so I don't have any to-do lists or tasks. I'm not a task-based kind of person. I'll have a, a like a direction for the day, but I don't like sit down and decide this direction like and, and write it down. I just know like today I'm writing, I'm writing stuff. So I know I've got a few things to write. Um, I don't have a list of those things, but there's, there's actually a list of the things in code. Like these are the things I need to do. Um, but like, they're not to do lists. They just happen to exist. And they're in front of me, like in a folder, let's say there's like five text files in a folder I want to improve. So I go today I'm going to spend all day really working on these five text files or these five documents, essentially. I'm gonna write them and rewrite them and read them and reread them and rewrite them and edit and read them out loud and just really get them right. So by the end of the day, I'm done with that and I can move on to something else tomorrow. Versus, um, I've got this and this and this and I'm gonna bounce back and forth, this, that, and I'll have this work, This I'll, I'll, I'll work on these, these five things over the next four days because I only have 15 minutes here and 20 minutes there. Like, that's not how I work. I work in long, continuous blocks of time focused on one or two things. In this case, five things, but it's really one thing, which are like this, this series of emails that people get after they sign up for, for Hey. Um, and so I'm just focusing on that. And in other days, it's like, I'm going to think through, um, the next batch of work we're going to do over the next six weeks. I'm going to come up with some ideas. I'm going to shake them out. I'm going to sketch sketch today. I'm going to sketch and think and write today. I don't know where I'm going to end up, but by the end of the day, I feel like I've gone through with some, some real ideas in my head and tomorrow I'll, I'll probably prepare those more formally. So 
that's kind of the extent of, of the balloon of work that I really have to do. You know, it kind of has these, you kind of blow it up. It has these edges and I don't let anything outside those edges get to me unless like there's an emergency or someone absolutely needs my attention for something else, that kind of thing. But that's kind of it. So I, it's very calm. I don't, you know, one of the things that's different about us at base camp is that we don't have, um, shared calendars. So I can't see what, what anyone else is doing. Yeah. I understand you hate doing. shared calendars. <laughs> I hate them because all they do is commoditize time and they make it available for the taking. They say, Hey, here's this person's schedule. Want to talk to them? We'll go steal a block from them. Go take an hour. Yeah, they send them an invite, and yeah, I guess they could click decline, but nobody does because that's not a nice thing to do to somebody, you know. So everyone ends up in meetings all day or with other with other people's time on their schedule. I, I want my schedule and everyone's schedule here to be completely open every single day. Everyone here should have a full eight-hour day to themselves to decide what they need to do. Now, they work with a small team, perhaps. They might be working on a project with three other people, and they coordinate with those three other people, and everyone knows what everyone's doing, and that's fine. Like there's conversation that goes back and forth, but everyone has a full open day to themselves. So nobody can take any of your time without asking. So if someone wants to get together with me or I need to get together with someone else, I'll ask them. I'll say, Hey, Jonas, do you have, um, you know, do you have an hour, uh, on Thursday or do you have any time Friday morning or I'm a free Wednesday afternoon? Well, you know, do you have any time and we'll go back and forth and it'll be a negotiation because it's their time I'm asking for. It's not my time to take. It's their time to offer, to give. So I'm asking for them. And then we, we negotiate and figure it out. And go, oh, okay, cool. Well, so we'll hook up at four o'clock on Wednesday. It sounds good. And like, that's it. And so we put it on our own personal calendars if we want, or if we don't, that's fine too. It's up to each individual person, but there's not this sense of like, this is my week. My week is determined by blocks of color on a calendar that other people put there. And I'm basically stuck with that week. I, I don't ever want to be that way. And I don't want anyone else to ever be that way. So our weeks are very open here. Um, and that's kind of how, uh, how we work. How do you get that four hours? Because I'm sure there are like, you well, said, it's actually eight, let's oh, say eight, eight, eight. It's really okay. eight. Yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of people who want your time. I'm sure you get invited to a lot of meetings. You get a lot of emails, you get social, I mean, you get stuff like from me to do these podcasts. Sure. How do you, and how can other people make sure that they get that time? Do you just say no a lot? Yes. You have to say no a lot. Um, that's number one is you have to guard your time and protect your time and realize that, you know, if, here, I'll step back for a second on this because companies, and you'll hear this saying all the time, right? But companies always say time is money, time, everyone, time is money. It's like, it, well, you don't act like it is because you wouldn't just give everyone your money, you know, like companies have budgets and they have CFOs and they have controllers and they have accountants and they have all these different things. And you, if you start spending your company's money frivolously, they're going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. What what's that about? But there's no one looking over the time. There's no CFT or actually a CTO, let's say not, not, not chief technical officer, but chief time officer, which I wouldn't want anyway. But my point is, is that there's no one actually guarding anyone's time. There's nobody here saying time is valuable. Time is important. And we all know it inherently to be the most valuable thing. You can't buy more time. You only get a limited amount. That's it. Yet we treat it like it's this unlimited commodity. Um, so, you know, I think you have to begin and everyone, like you said, everybody wants everyone else's, which is why they keep asking you for it. Um, and so you'd have to be very, very good at saying no. And I'll say, I'll say no most to most things, including my own ideas all the time. Um, and then occasionally I say yes to things that I think would be fun to do or interesting to do, or, um, someone I want to talk to or a podcast I want to do. Like I leave those things open because I say no to so many other things. I have openings. I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that on Monday. Like for example, today, we're doing this podcast on Monday. Um, my rest of my day is completely open. The only thing I had on my calendar today is, is our podcast from two to three. That's it. And most days are like that. I might have one or two things on my calendar. And, you know, I, I'll tend to, if I can, I'll tend to gang them together. So if I do have to do two things in a given day, I'll try to do them like early in the morning. So then I have a full contiguous stretch of time. If I have something at 11 and something at two, well, now I have like, I've broken my day up in a way where I can't have long contiguous blocks. So you want to, th if you do have to schedule things, you want to think about how you can schedule them together essentially. Um, so you have long stretches of time because if you, if you stagger them out through the day, you're just breaking your day into small bits. 
and then you're kind of screwed because you'll never get that chance to even have a long period of time. So yeah, you have batching, to be very thoughtful about tasks. that. Yeah, I do yeah. that. I do that a lot with with email and social media. I try to only check it once a day at four o'clock, and then I I try to uh, also not do any meetings on Mondays, Wednesdays, or Fridays. So I'm I try very very hard to to do a lot yeah. of that too because. I mean, I experienced that as well. You know, years ago, you, people want to pick your brain, ask you a question, jump on the phone for a couple of minutes, have a chat, and then your whole day goes by, and you're like, "What the hell just happened?" Yeah, you're like, "Man, I I, I was so busy today, but I got nothing done." Yeah, I felt, and like that's that the all worst the feeling, right? Yep. Like busy with nothing to show for it, and yep. that's common, unfortunately. So yeah, you're right. And it was worse. I mean, it was also really, you know, in, in my situation where I work for myself, it was also like that was social media, you know, 10 years ago when Twitter was getting started and Facebook and LinkedIn were becoming more mainstream and you get lots of interactions. You would just nonstop check social media, post on social media, connect with people on social media. But at the end of the day, nothing gets done. Right. And so it's it's uh, I think it's terrible. Now, yeah, I would treat those things again, like just step back. I treat those things like breaks. Like you deserve some breaks during the day. Yeah. <laughs> and those are good moments for breaks. It's like, you know, 40 years ago, people would go take a smoke break outside, right? Yeah. And everyone was like, that's cool. Go take us, go smoke us. Or even, I guess 40 years ago, they'd smoke inside, whatever it was. But like people would take little breaks. They'd take a 15 minute break, 20 minute, whatever it is. Like that's fine. And social is a good thing for that, I would say. Like social is kind of like, a cigarette in a sense. Um, yeah. And I, I think like actually it's very addictive and I mean that in a literal sense too, in a bad way. But point is, is that it's a little bit of a moment just to take a break and, and scroll through something mindlessly. You know, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, but yeah, if you're checking it every five minutes all throughout the day, and that's actually what work has become in a sense for a lot of people, which is checking stuff all the time. Yeah. Um, you're never gonna get anything done. You're never gonna feel satisfied. All right, this is a little bit of a tangent, but you brought it up, uh, and it's about social media and addiction because there are some people out there who say, "What are you talking about?" You know, um, in the, in the sixties and seventies, everybody would sit around the breakfast table reading the newspaper, or they would sit on the subway reading a newspaper. Now it's just the device has changed, and it's a phone now instead of a newspaper. So, you know, the behaviors haven't changed. It's just the the what we're looking at that's changed. Yeah. Do you, do you agree with that? Um. To some degree I do, but the thing is, is that today's things that you're looking at are actually engineered for engagement and engineered for addiction. Yeah. So it's different. It's not that, you know, sometimes you, you'll, you'll see people with pictures of, um, on the train, like on the train in the thirties or the forties or something like yeah, that. everyone's exactly. reading a book. Right. Yeah. And, and it's like, well, see, everything's the same. Well, I, I don't think it's the same. I don't think it's the same because now we're, we're we've become addicted, um, methodically addicted. These companies know what addicts people; they know what generates engagement. And so, um, social and um, well, primarily social is really programmed to increase dopamine hits. It's not really programmed to for learning or for for you know um, uh, for, uh, intellectual stimulation or engagement. Like when you look back at those pictures of people reading books, I think I would say that that was a more valuable, um, use of time yeah. than just mindlessly scrolling through photos. And again, well, and it's, it's also not one way, right? Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, when you read a book, the book doesn't engage back with you, but right. with a phone, I mean, if you're reading social media, it, it engages back with you. And that's the not big only, difference that a lot of people forget. Yes. And not only that, um, these, these systems, these platforms are, are targeted in, in very specific ways to know, they, they know what gets you going. They know what kind of stuff you read. So they keep feeding more and more and more and more of it to you. It's kind of like a rat drinking, you know, sugar water going back and back and back and back and back and back and back over and over and over because that's what the, the rat wants the sugar water. So these platforms are giving you your own version of sugar water, your perfectly tailored, specific to you version of sugar water. And if, so, you know, we're, we're captive to these these platforms. I do think it's different. I think it's quite a bit different, even though fundamentally we are, quote, consuming content, as people would say, which is what we used to do in newspapers and books as well. Of course, people still do that in those mediums as well. But <clears throat> you have more control over those mediums. And even people who think they're in control of their social stuff, you're not. You're not in control of it, just like you're not in control of your cigarette addiction or your whatever addiction, your alcohol addiction. You're not really in control of those things. These, these things are chemically, they chemically have their hold on you, and so does social media. And I think yeah. 
you can have you can have a healthy relationship with some of these things. Like you can have a healthy relationship with drinking if you want to drink here and there, whatever. Like you know, you can take these things to the extreme, or you can you can you can have a, have your say. But I think what's happening is a lot of people don't recognize necessarily how much control these companies have over them, and they tell these companies tell you what to believe, tell you what you think is true, tell you who to vote for, tell all these things. That's pretty intense, and I, I so I don't think it's quite the same. Oh yeah, not even close. So yeah. uh, for those of you listening, reading a book is not the same freaking thing as being <laughs> on social media, all right? <laughs> Just because you're looking in the same direction does not mean that the actual interaction is the same. Right. Um, so getting back to the, the original thing that I wanted to ask you is, do you say no to your people and how? And also, do your people ever say no to you and how do they say no to you? Yeah, well, we, the way we say no is... <clears throat> We decide essentially what we're going to do every six weeks. So we have this this system we've built called Shape Up. And if you're anyone's interested, you can go to basecamp.com slash shape up, S-H-A-P-E-U-P. And it's a method of work. It's a, it's a way, it's the actual way in which we work on product development. Uh, it's We work in what we call six-week cycles. Every six weeks, we decide what we're going to do for the next six weeks. We don't plan beyond that. So we're planning just six weeks at a time. And so every six weeks we decide what we're going to do. And then once we decide what we're going to do, we set off to do it. And so there's no need to be negotiating what we're doing all the time. There's really very little need to say no to each other or yes to each other because the work is already laid out essentially for the next six weeks. And we're all focused on that. And the idea is that we have to give everybody a full eight hour day to focus on the work that they're going to do. A lot of it is problem solving. A lot of them is, a lot of the time is figuring things out. Um, and um, what we can't do is pull people off of things constantly. So I can't say, this is your project for the next six weeks. And by the way, and then three weeks in say, hey, by the way, I need you to do this. I need you to do this. I need you to do this. Because that's when things become very difficult to say no to or to say yes to. When you're running out of time, when your superior, for, for example, tells you you need to do something else, very hard to say no in those situations. It's like we don't create those situations where people have to say yes or no. The no's come from deciding what not to do every six weeks. And the yeses come from deciding what to do every six weeks. And then from that point on, people basically have their, have their, their, their you know, the next six weeks set up for them in a sense. Not task-based, but like directionally these are the problems we're trying to solve over the next six weeks. This is the direction we're going to go over the next six weeks. And then each individual team has control over their little project to decide what to cut, what to keep, what to add, what to lose, whatever they need to do to fit it into the time frame that they've been given to do this. So that's where they start to say no, or that's where they start to say yes. And so they say yes. When they say no, or they say yes, they're essentially saying no or yes to me. Um, and to the company because we've decided we're going to go in this direction and they're saying well, let's go in this direction But we're going to take a two degree turn to the left to do this diff slightly differently because that's the only way we can get it done in this amount of time So the yeses and nos are actually It's not about meetings It's not like about because what's hard is someone's like hey, can I talk to you? And you're like no like that's that's a weird no the nos and yeses we have here are about the actual work itself and everyone here is given the autonomy and the agency to decide how much and how little work they're going to do to get the the idea done. So that's that's the control they have. As far as like directly saying no or yes to somebody, it all comes down to what the thing is. But in most cases, like those questions aren't so pointed that either one of those answers would be terrible. Like if I said, uh, hey, hey, uh, hey, Waylon, Waylon runs our podcast. I said, hey, Waylon, are you available to get together tomorrow? And she's like, no, I can't because I've got this. What about Friday? Like she technically said no. And I'd be like, that's fine. Uh, Friday, yeah, that sounds good. So like it's, these are, these are easy discussions. These are easy yeses and nos to have because they're not based on like someone feeling like someone's taking, stealing their, their ability to get the, the work done that they need to do. It's more of like, Yes is no's on the on the on the uh, on the outskirts of the work itself, which are much easier to deal with. They're not so fundamental to the actual day to day work. I don't know if that helps or not. I know it's a little bit abstract, but no, no, it does. Yeah. Um, okay. But I'm but I'm curious if somebody like the situation I was thinking of is if somebody's trying to give you more work. Um, so we so we don't have that. So that this is actually really important. Nobody gives anyone more work here. So even even if you're a leader, that's correct. So okay. work is set. Well, I mean. 
we do every six weeks. Every six weeks, we set out to decide to define the projects we're going to be working on over the next six weeks. And those projects are explained in a broad sense. Like, I'll give you something more specific. Like, we want to add a calendar to Basecamp or something like that. Um, here are the things we think we need to do. Here's sort of what we're trying to get out of it. Um, like, this is the big idea. And then a team is assigned to it. Let's say a team of three, which would be maybe two programmers and one designer. And now they, that's the only thing that they are responsible for over the next six weeks, nothing else. So no one can pull them off their work. No one can give them additional projects to do. No one can tell them not to do that. Like this is all they have to do over the next six weeks. And I can't pull them off. I mean, like technically I can, but that's not how we work. Like no one pulls anyone off to go, oh, I've got a new idea three weeks in, or I got a new idea two weeks in, or let's, let's scrap that and do something else. Like that's not how it goes. You can't have leadership that's having a new idea every five minutes and pulling people in five different directions every other day. Like that doesn't work. So we decide what we're going to do every six weeks. We set the team off and that's all the team is responsible for. Now, if there's an emergency, a legitimate emergency, the servers are down, the whatever is broken in a bad way, like and we need to pull people off to fix like a hole in the boat, like different story. But other than that, if there's a new idea that comes up that we want to do, we have to wait till the work is done and then we can consider it for the next six week cycle of work. So that's how that works. Interesting. I'm wondering, um, cause you know, in, in a lot of organizations, just random stuff comes up all the time. Uh, you know, sit yeah. on this meeting, we need to work on this project, we need you to create a proposal for this or a contract for that. And I'm just trying to think of, because that, that's, you know, the reality for most employees out there. And I'm trying to think of how can they constructively say no so that they can uh, be able to get more time to actually get work done. I don't know if you have any suggestions on that. Yeah. They or, probably, or people say yeah. no to you. Yeah, but they pro the problem is there in that situation that you described, which is very common, which is like new things are coming up all the time and people are being sent in different directions constantly. This is a constant state of, of chaos. It's not calm. And the problem is, is not the individual employee. The problem is, is the method in which the company works, um, the culture, uh, the expectations, they're all out of whack. And until those are, are put in line with a calmer approach to work, um, things are gonna be forever chaotic at that place. So it's very difficult then to forge a calmer approach to work and to be able to say no, or I mean, you can say no, you go like, hey, hey, you know, boss, or whatever you would say, like, hey, boss, uh, or you know, whatever, Jim, Sally, whatever her, his or her name is, um, you know, I'm, I'm focused on this right now because I need to get this done by Tuesday. Maybe I can take a look at that proposal on Wednesday or something like that. Um, you, you could try those kind of things where it's not like a no, it's like a not now, how about later? Or like I'm in the middle of something that someone else asked me to do or I have this on my plate. I don't have any time for that. Like I, it all depends on, on you know, who you're talking with and how yeah. they're going to receive the news and the culture of the company. Um, but at some point you have to carve out your own space. You have to say yes, no, no, I, not now, maybe later, whatever it is. But, if, but fundamentally the problem is, is that if the company is always bouncing around, then you're always going to get bounced around. You know, it's like you think about like a bounce house, you know, like a kid's yeah. bounce house. You can't stand in the bounce house if everyone else is jumping around. You can't stand still. It's not possible. Everyone is being bounced around because the system is bouncy. And so you've got to find a system that doesn't that has a, a solid ground that if a few people are bouncing around over there, you're not being pushed around like that's that's what shape up is for us. That's our method of work. And that's why we've written it up in detail so other people can read it and adopt it or at least take something from it. Because I believe this is a really, really important thing to learn. Yeah. It's how to run a calm company and not a chaotic one. It's funny. There's somebody on my team. So I have, I have a smaller team of 10 people. And uh, one of the people who works with me, her name is, um, we'll call her Michelle. She helps me with a lot of, of, of content stuff. You know, when I create courses, she helps me create worksheets. She, she creates a lot of, you know, writing and content for me. Yep. And she actually started doing this really clever thing. And I, I, it took me a little while to notice what she was doing, but she was saying no in a very subtle way. And I would throw tons of work at her. And she would say, you, you send me all these different projects. How would you prioritize them? Ooh, good one. And and then and then I would realize I was like, oh, back wow, on you, that, huh? That's that's a lot of freaking work I just sent you, huh? Well, why don't you start with this and then do that? And so it took me a little while to realize that she was actually managing me and in a in a nice way, saying, I have too much. You need to tell me what you want to get done first, and when I'm done, then I'll move on to the next thing. That's such a great 
she's she's a pro because that's she a is. seriously good way of doing it. Um, yeah, it's also I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow that story uh, because um, it's such a great a great piece of advice, which is like if you think you're getting a whole bunch of stuff that's unreasonable, just kind of ask it back to the person who's giving it to you. Like, how would you handle that? Yeah, and how would you they prioritize will have all these think different about things. It. Yeah, and go, oh, gosh, I don't know how I would handle that either. That's a lot. Maybe I would do this first, and then then you kind of have permission now to, to stay focused. So I, that was wonderful. That, that's great advice. Yeah, because when, I, when she asks me that, I can't say, oh, they're, you know, prioritize all of them. Like, I'm forced to... I do to, them all at once. Like, yeah. You, you would know that that's unreasonable, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm forced to give her, you know, an order of which to get these things done. And and then everything is fine, and she basically said no, and I don't, you know. <laughs> so I, I love the way that she does that's that. That's wonderful. That's um, smart. Yeah. Really smart. Yeah. She's, uh, maybe I'll have her on the podcast one day. Share, <laughs> share her secrets. She's great. <laughs> uh, so I'm really curious. We only have around like uh, 12 minutes or so left. Um, I wanted to learn a little bit more about working at Basecamp because you guys have some unique ways that you work. So for example, I understand during summer, what is it? Um, Fridays are off. It's only a four day work week. Like you have some very unique and some would say quirky ways of, of actually running the business. So can you share any of what it's like to work there? Yeah, sure. Um, well, let's see. We do, um, we do like you, like you mentioned, we do four day work weeks in the summer. So 32 hour weeks in the summer. So we have Friday off or if people want to take Monday off or Wednesday, off, they can take whatever day off. But and, and why did Friday. you do that? Um, we did it kind of as an experiment. Um, and we also did it because I think that seasons are, are healthy. So, you know, when we all used to, when we all grew up, we, most of us, at least, we'd go to school and we'd take summers off. You have school summers off, and maybe you did went to camp or you had a half a uh, part time job or you hung around the house or whatever you did, right? Um, and then you know, school comes back online. When is it? Like uh, August, October? Or I don't even remember uh, yep. September, whatever it is. Um, and you had, some, but you had some months off, and things changed. And, and something ended and something new began and then something ended and something new began. I think that's healthy. And so um, we were thinking about how to do that at work. Um, and we said, well, you know, we had this idea of like, what if we worked fewer hours? Like what would happen? Would we still get the same amount of work done? Would we get a lot less work done? And we, it turns out we get less work done, but not that much less. And in fact, it's kind of a nice way to force even more focus because when you have less time to waste, you, you, have, you waste less of it. You know, it's just like any resource. Um, when it's scarce, you, you take more care of it and you conserve it. So we started running that experiment. I believe we actually started doing that all year round. And then we're like, eh, this is too much. We're not actually getting enough done. And we're, we're a little bit, this just isn't really where we want to be, but we like, still like the feeling of it. So we said, let's just go back to seasons. So let's do summers off just like you would when you're growing up. I mean, it's not summers off of work, but it's an extra day off a week. Um, and people can have three-day weekends. They can enjoy the summer. I know depending on the hemisphere you're in, we have a few people now in the southern hemisphere, so it's a little bit different for them, I guess. But most of us, 98% of us work in the northern hemisphere where the summer is the summer, same months. And um, and, uh, and it's nice to have a three-day weekend. You come back refreshed. You, you appreciate it more. Maybe you get to do some things you wouldn't have been able to do if you only had two days, if Friday or Saturday and Sunday. And, you know, it it puts different kinds of pressure on us because they're definitely, we have to be a little bit less ambitious in the summer, but I think that's okay too. Like, again, like what's the rush? Um, things are going to be fine and let's just try and either be more efficient or not do as much stuff or say no to more things or even find simpler versions of things to do or, you know, cut out more waste or whatever it might be until we get to the point where we can't cut any more and that's fine. And if we can't get it done, we just can't get it done. That's okay too. So we just, you know, are very careful about, making sure we don't create too much work for ourselves in the summer months in, in, in uh, you know, May through September. So anyway, that's kind of what we do. So we have that. Um, we also, um, I think we have probably the best benefits pack. I'm going to brag here for a second, but probably the best benef benefits package in the world, I would say. Um, if, if you go to basecamp.com slash handbook, you can see our entire employee handbook online and you can see the section about benefits and read it for yourself. And we take very, very, very good care of people here. And that's one of the reasons why We've wanted to stay small um, because the fewer people you have, the more money you can essentially spread across them in the form of benefits and really nice uh, perks and whatnot. So we take really good care of people that way. Um, we allow people to work wherever they want to work. So we have mo we're mostly a remote company. We have 14 people in Chicago. Actually, I think it's 13 or 12 now. Two people just moved away. Um, 
think 12 people in Chicago and um, the rest are in all, you know, 40 different cities around the world. And even the people who work in Chicago rarely come to the office so we can work remotely. And it's just kind of a wonderful way to work. You work wherever you want to work and in the environment that you find to be productive for yourself. You can come to the office, you can work in a co-working space, you can work at home, you can work in a coffee shop, whatever it is. And a lot of autonomy, open days, um, wherever you want to work, uh, you know, shorter summer hours, uh, clear expectations over the next six weeks, but then nothing beyond that. And then all you have to focus on over the next six weeks is the stuff that's been, that, that, that you're going to be, that's kind of been assigned to you in a broad sense. So it's a, it's a very, I would say like, this is going to sound kind of weird, but like a very adult place to work. I feel like a lot of companies <laughs> that doesn't are, sound are very, weird at all. <laughs> yeah. I feel like a lot of companies are, are kind of childish, you know, they, they treat people, they treat adults like children, um, like too much checking in and too much, you know, like you can't think for yourself and, and too much needing permission to do everything. And you know, we're, we're very open-minded here about like, we have great people who work here. We want them to have a full day to themselves. Here's some, here's a direction we're headed. You figure it out. You go and figure this out yourself. Um, we trust you. And if you have questions and you need help, you can ask for it. Of course, we're always here to help. But for the most part, we trust you to get your job done and make good judgment calls along the way. So that's kind of how we, how we are here. It's funny. A lot of people brag, uh, you know, the whole inbox zero where they, they can never get rid of all their emails. And for me, that's a clear sign of somebody who's micromanaging because there's really no, re I mean, if you're giving your employees decision-making power and autonomy, they really shouldn't be CCing you and including you in every single email that goes out and you would have no problem, you know, getting to inbox zero. But yeah. in, inside of a lot of organizations, we, we don't give employees any autonomy, no freedom, no decision-making. And so they always have to CC everybody else all the time. And then, um, you know, everyone gets a thousand emails every day. Totally. And there's too many people involved in too many decisions. And that's the other thing we try to limit here. We don't really have meetings here. If we do, there's like three people in the room max. Wow. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want a lot of people in the room around any, any table. Um, we, we can have company-wide discussions, and we do in, in base camp all the time. But when it comes down to actually making a decision, fewer people make better decisions. Yeah. Um, you can listen to a lot of people and inform yourselves, but a few people should hash it out and make a call and move on. Um, so we're very careful about that. And I think one of the best ways to be indecisive is to ask just one more opinion. Sometimes we think like having another opinion is going to make things clearer. It actually makes things fuzzier almost always, unless everybody agrees. If everybody agrees, you probably didn't need it anyway, but it can be confirmation. But in the case where not everybody agrees and you ask one more peop one more person their point of view or two more people their point of views, it just slows everything down. You become you start to second guess yourself some more, indecision sets in and things slow down, you don't get anywhere. So we're very, very careful about that. We make calls quickly, recognizing that most decisions are temporary anyway. There are very few things that we decide that we can't change our minds on. Um, there are always some, but most things we can change our mind on and we just kind of keep that in mind so it doesn't like, we're not, we don't live in fear of the decisions we have to make. Yeah. Well, um, maybe one more question for you before I yeah. have some uh, just fun rapid fire questions for you. And um, it's really around advice that you would give to leaders of organizations. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are part of organizations that are probably quite large, hundreds, thousands of employees. And maybe they're looking to adopt or emulate some of the practices that you have. What can leaders do to start to, I don't know, make, make changes, give their employees more time, practice the autonomy, the decision making, what, any steps that you would take if you, let's say, took over as CEO of a big company? Yeah, sure. So the first thing I would probably do is you, you got to tread gently and lightly initially because some of these ideas are pretty radical and like will flop if you just kind of try to go cold turkey and like throw them all on a company. <clears throat> so one of the things we encourage people to do is, um, and this kind of proves itself out pretty quickly. If you, if you work somewhere where everyone's talking all the time and it's chaotic and talking either out loud or via chat, or it's like craziness at work, basically like too much communication and interruption all day long, instant messaging, chat, all this stuff. Just say like pick one day a month, let's say the first Thursday of every month. Um, no one can talk to each other period in any way. No, unless, again, unless there's like a fire and you need to get the out of the office, right? Like no one can talk to each other. Just let everyone have a day to themselves one day a month. Not a day off, but a day at work to themselves. No meetings, no conversations, no sound, no chat, no interpersonal communication, nothing. And 
one day a month, what will happen is people do that. It's a little, it'll be a little awkward the first time or two. Pretty soon, people are going to become much more self-independent. Um, and and um, they are going to um, go, God, I, that was amazing. I got so much stuff done that Thursday. Can we do that again? Like, can we do that twice a month? And what's going to happen is, is this going to, it's going to infect the organization. Everyone's going to want more of that because they're going to see what their normal days look like. And then they're going to have contrast. If you want to change something, you need to provide some contrast to show the difference. And so that's like the simplest version of difference I can come up with, which is one day a month. And if you can't spare one day a month to do this, then like you're in deep trouble. You should be able to spare one day a month for an experiment to improve the way you work. Yeah. Um, so I would try that and like let the results speak for themselves. But you got to give it maybe maybe you have to give it a couple because the first one's going to be a little awkward. People are going to be giggling in strange ways. It's going to be just weird, you know, because people aren't used to it. But they're going to look back and then go, God, that was amazing. I got so much stuff done. It's just like when you have to jump on a plane and go somewhere and your flight's three hours. Like you get so much done in that three hours if you're actually working than you would if you were in the office for three hours. Yeah, you can't talk to anybody. You're just sitting there. <laughs> yeah. If you can simulate that at work, which is what we are every day. But for a company that's not like that, I would just say take that easy step by picking one day a month and try it. And you'll see it's going to be great. Maybe it turns out that for, for whatever reason, your organization is not like ours and you can't do what we do every day for whatever reason, but you can do it two days a week or one day a week or three days, whatever it is. You find the right balance for you. But I would start with one day a month and people are going to feel it and want more of it. And then then it kind of begins to take on a life of its own and, and you, you kind of settle out and figure out what's going to work out for you. I like that. Okay, so for leaders, try to implement something like that. Um, any other... Uh, any other things that you recommend leaders do in their organizations besides um, that, that one thing or uh, is that kind of the, the, the best? Yeah, I would do that. Truly, I would just do that. Like that's enough. Okay. That's hard enough for a lot of companies, even though it shouldn't be, but I would just start there. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, we'll ask you questions for you. Just rapid fire questions. Um, starting off with what has been your greatest failure? Um, this is going to sound weird, but I don't think about failure. I, I, I think about like mistakes and then they're just moments in time. So I, I just, I don't really look back on things and go, that was a, I mean, clearly I've made mistakes in my life, but like they're, they're moments and I, you, you kind of move on from them yeah. and hopefully you don't do them again. It's not like, what'd you learn from them? It's more like, what don't you want to do again? Um, <laughs> what's been your but, biggest, biggest business mistake, I guess. Yeah. I mean, this, you know, um, I think, I think, um, a sense of delusion, um, in that, Back in, before we switched our company, so we used to be called 37 Signals. Today we're called Basecamp. This happened about six years ago. We switched over our name. Because right before that, we built four or five or six, depending on how you count, different products. And we had a small company. We had 20 or 30 people at that time, maybe 20 or something, 20-ish. And what happened was we, we were became addicted to building new things. Because that's exciting. You build new stuff and you launch new things. And every year we built something that we built. 2004 we launched a product. In 2005 we launched a product. Actually, a couple. 2006 we launched a product. 2007 we launched a product. We, you know, we kept launching these things. And um, but we also wanted to stay a small company. And what ended up happening was we had too many products. We began to neglect them. We weren't improving them over time. And but we didn't want to hire more people. So we got ourselves in this corner, which is like. We can't maintain everything we've built at a high level of quality that would satisfy us and satisfy our customers, yet we don't want to grow. What are we going to do? Um, so we decided ultimately to go all in on just one thing, on Basecamp. So we spun off other products or merged them into Basecamp so we can go down to essentially focusing entirely on one product. That was a great idea. But before that, getting ourselves to the point of having to make that decision, um, I think, was a big mistake of ours. We didn't see the implication the longer term implication of building more and more new things. We didn't recognize that we'd have to maintain these things over time. We'd have to improve these things over time. And it was in direct uh, conflict with our, also our interest not to grow. A lot of companies could do what we did, but they would keep hiring and hiring and hiring, but we didn't want to do that. So we, we kind of, I guess, had blinders on and didn't pay attention to the reality. Like what we wanted and what we were doing were two different things. Um, so it. It was a little bit of an organizational turmoil there and to figure out how to deal with that. But okay. we made the right call ultimately, but I think that was, I think we got ourselves in a, in a corner in a pickle there and, and had to deal with it. What's your most embarrassing moment at work? <laughs> embarrassing moment. Um, you know, um, I think what, what I'm personally embarrassed by at the moment 
is the, I've lost some of my skills that I used to have. And um, I have new skills now. I do different things now. But you know, when I, when I started this business, I did all the design, all the visual design, all the HTML, and then when CSS came out, basically I was doing all the CSS and all the styling and everything, right? Um, a little bit of JavaScript and all that stuff. And, and my skills there have definitely atrophied because I haven't been focused on that stuff. I've been focusing on other things. And so it's more of a personal embarrassment to me that like I can't always go in and fix things like I used to do or go in and, and update things like I used to do or change things like I like. Or if I can, it just takes me like a day to dig in and figure out what the hell's going on before I can do it. When before I've been like, oh, I know how to fix this or I know where that is or I know how to do that. Um, and so there's there's this is like a constant state for me now because I've just for the last number of years I've been doing things, focusing on different things and trying to like help other people and build up teams and doing a lot more writing and a lot more strategic thinking and a lot more sort of quote CEO style stuff, which I enjoy a lot. But it also means that I had to give up some of my other skills and. They're still there, but like they've definitely atrophied, and I yeah. find that to be difficult to handle sometimes. More okay. frustrating. It's more frustrating, I guess, than embarrassing. Although I'm personally embarrassed by it, I would say, but it's really more personally frustrating that I have to ask someone else to help me to do something I used to be able to do on my own. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, what are you most proud of? Uh, my team, um, the company we have here, the, the way people treat each other, um, the fact that. Just like today, we just celebrated another employee who had their 10th year anniversary here today. Um, you know, a lot of people here stick around. We've, I think, close to half of our company's been with us for more than five years. Um, something like 25, maybe of the 50 some odd or 20, or been with us more than seven years. I mean, we, we have a really good crew. People who stick, stick here, stick around, treat each other well are enjoyable to work with and continue to grow and become better people and take care of each other. Like that's the stuff that I love aside from all the fundamental, like I love the problem, very proud of the products we put on very, very, very proud of the way we treat our customers, all that stuff. I'm, I'm proud of what we stand for, but I think ultimately um, I'm really proud of what happens inside the company and how we work and how we respect each other and how we treat each other and how we were there for each other, but also how we go away for each other and that like we're not, working together all the time we have lives outside of work and we're individuals outside of work and i really appreciate that too um, we're not the kind of company that says like well, everyone's family here we all need to do everything for each other no matter what it takes like i don't i don't think that that's a healthy thing for companies i think companies should we should treat each other as co-workers respectfully but we're not a quote a family who's willing to do anything for each other but we're willing to look out for each other uh, as friends would um and as 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 respectful co-workers would um, and, and I'm really proud of how that's turned out. So yeah, my people, my team, being part of that team, being able to work around wonderful people every day. And also I would say like broadly, even more broadly is, is our ability to maintain our independence. So to me personally, independence is the most valuable thing in business. I don't have to answer to anybody. I don't have to answer to investors. We don't have any, I don't have to answer to the public and that we're not a public company. I have of course answered to some degree to our customers. But that's a much different deal. I like that deal. They pay us directly. We respond for them. We build things for them. That's better, and that's fine than just responding to someone who who happens to own a piece of your company or the public who owns 300 shares of your company or something like that. I don't ever want to be in that situation. So hmm. we get to do the things we want to do the way we want to do them, and that's incredibly valuable to me and something I'm very proud of. What's your favorite business or non-business book? And it can't be one of yours. Um... Business or non-business book. So there's a book. Um, let me just get the yeah. So the title of it here. So it's 60 pages long, very short. It's called The Manual by Epictetus. The Manual. The Manual um, by Epictetus. Although it's translated, he was a Stoic philosopher um, way back when, and I find it to be the most profound 60 pages I've ever read. And it's not even 60 pages because it's 60 pages, but some of the pages are like three sentences or like a paragraph or two. And it's just 60 thoughts on um, how to live a better life, um, how to live a life of tranquility or a life of calm or a life that you're recognize what you're in control of and what you're not in control of. Um, it's kind of how to, how to live a good life and uh, 60 pages and that's it. And it's wonderful. And so that's kind of something that I actually try to read that book almost once a month right now, like lately. I've been because I want to I want to just really make sure that I hammer these points home in my head. 
Um, and I find them to be really profound and interesting. So that's something that uh, I'd recommend everyone check out. And really, you can check, you can read it in an hour. It's, it's very short. All right. Last two questions for you. Who's the best mentor you've ever had? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I haven't had like a mentor. Um, I, I tend to just pay attention to what other people are doing. So like, I think typically the way mentorships or the way mentor is sort of used is that, um, um, mentor is usually someone, you know, who you can call on, who can coach you, who can answer questions, who can help you through things. I think there's a lot, I would say I have a lot of mentors that I've never met. People who I admire, people who I respect, business, local businesses, small businesses, big businesses, all sorts of different people. Um, I just take a little bit from everybody. Uh, so I don't really feel like I can answer that question specifically. Um, although I will say like, my dad gave me some advice that, that, um, that it's probably the most valuable advice I've received in business, um, which is, um, no one ever went broke taking a profit. And that's sort of something that I always think about. I always want to do things profitably. We've been in business for 20 years. We've been profitable every year for 20 years. It's very, that means a lot to me. It's very, I have to be very, I'm very careful about making sure that we don't spend too much money, that we're always coming out ahead every year, that kind of thing. So I would say like, as far as advice, that advice I got from my dad is really, really valuable. Um, another piece of advice I got, um, this one came from Jeff Bezos, um, was um, invest in the things that don't change. Um, so his whole point of view on this was um, he puts a lot of money and a lot of time and investment into all sorts of new things at Amazon and whatnot. But also, like, fundamentally, Amazon's – he would say, like, people don't want to wake up in 10 – people aren't going to wake up in 10 years and go, I wish I got my packages slower from Amazon or like people aren't gonna wake up in 10 years and go, I wish customer service was worse at Amazon or people aren't gonna wake up in 10 years and go, I wish selection was worse at Amazon. So his idea was, he gives this advice years ago, um, was just like focus on the things that don't change. So figure out in your business, what do you need to be good at now? That'll never not be important. Uh, I know it's a double negative there, but um, so for example, we've invested heavily in improving and sustaining, I think, the best customer service in the business. Um, and like people aren't going to wake up and wonder like in which our customer service was worse. They're always going to want it to be better. And we're making, we've just been investing so much in hiring an amazing team and, and getting back to people within a matter of minutes. If they email us, not a matter of days or hours, but minutes with, with real responses. We don't automate anything. There's no AI, there's no bot. It's all humans. Um, and, um, uh, and they're all great people. Um, they're making a career out of customer service, like all these things. So that's an example for us of, um, of and also like performance, like people aren't going to want Basecamp and our other products to be slower. So we can always invest in performance and infrastructure to make sure things, and people aren't going to say, I wish things were less secure. You know, so those are the kinds of things that I think have really um, helped um, prime us for focusing on the, on the fundamentals that matter. And also still, of course, being able to do new things too. All right, and very last question for you. If you were doing a different career, what do you think you would have ended up doing? Um, I don't know. Uh, I went to school. I got a degree in finance, but I never like wanted to work in a bank or anything like that. I just got that degree because I, I was good at it. Um, I don't know. I think if I was to ever stop doing base camp, I would not start another business again, almost certainly would not start another business again. Um, if I was fortunate enough to just re retire at some point, um, I mean, I still always want to do something, but I would probably like get into ceramics and just learn that. I, I love ceramics and I think it'd be fun just to do that all day. But I don't know. I mean, like I'm 45, I, I, I'm focused on base camp. I want to keep doing base camp for another 20 plus years. Um, and so I, I tend not to think of, of other things I would do if, if it's a totally fair question, by the way, I just don't like, I don't, I don't have a great answer for it. I'm not sure what I would have done. I'm not sure what I would do. And I'm, I'm very lucky and fortunate that I'm able to do what I do. Um, and I'm currently in control of that. And that's, uh, that's a, a important thing for me. Hey, that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, well, Jason, thank you so much for your time. And where can people go to learn more about you and Basecamp? I mean, anything that you want to mention for people to check out? I know you've been doing a lot of writing on Medium, uh, Medium as well. Uh, so anything for people to, to check out? 
Uh, Twitter, uh, at Jason Freed, F-R-I-E-D. Um, we have a podcast, too, called Rework. That's at rework.fm, where we talk a lot about some of these things that we talked about. Um, and then um, check out Hey, H-E-Y dot com, which is our newest product, which is launching in April. And there's some stuff up about it now. If you're curious about email and curious about what we're doing next, I think that'd be a cool thing to check out. Very cool. Well, Jason, thank you again for taking time out of your day. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Take care. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Again, Jason Fried has been my guest. Uh, he's super easy to find. Just Google him. You'll find his articles on Medium and check out some of the resources that he mentioned. And I will see all of you next week. Thanks again for tuning into the Future of Work with Jacob Morgan. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to grab a copy of my book, The Future Leader, and get leadership advice and insights directly from 140 of the world's top CEOs, then check out getfutureleaderbook.com. Please don't forget to rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts. And my contact info again is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. <laughs>